back to the Big Plantation, everybody. We're into our second guest of the night, Harry Wedler. And uh, her information was absolutely right in front of me. She's uh, www.inrogue.com. You can also find her at Twitter at uh, something that I no longer have up in front of me. I apologize. Oh. Hold on. Here we go. Carrie in Rogue <laughs> and uh, Facebook.com slash Carrie Wedler. And uh, you can get her YouTube channel. It's on the Big Plantation. Uh, if I said it, you wouldn't be able to make it out. But, Carrie, are you with us? I'm here. How are you? Hello, Wonderful. Carrie. Welcome Glad to the Big Plantation. You. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. So, okay. so Carrie, <laughs> obviously you, you had a video that went absolutely viral. Just in case anybody hasn't actually seen it, why don't you just give us the rundown on what it was? Well, I took my last artifact of support for Barack Obama from 2008, which was a T-shirt I had that said Obama is my homeboy with a picture of him smiling. And after giving a recap of why I clearly no longer support him, I blowtorched it, and it was really fun. <laughs> now, I, you've, you've gotten, I mean, how many views is this up to? It's almost a million, right? Um. Almost. It passed 800,000, so I, I'm hoping it'll get to a million eventually. Uh, it was pretty... I, mean, I was surprised. I thought that it was one of my better videos, but it just blew me away at how many people watched it. So what kind of response have you gotten? Um, overwhelmingly positive. I have gotten some progressives who think that I missed the point and that we just need to get someone better in office. And then I've gotten the most negative reaction was from neocons, which you might have expected because there was some anti-war sentiment in there. And they just wanted to be angry at me because I put Barack Obama in office and it's my fault and I should be apologizing to them. And, you know, that was the worst I got. But other than that, most people were really supportive and it's people from all over the political spectrum. So it was really encouraging. You know, one thing that really that really kind of resonates with me on the whole story is because Barack Obama drew in a lot of young people. That was like the driving force behind a lot of his voting bloc, especially in 2008. And and as we all know, Libertarians and Ron Paul voters were very, very young too. So I feel like that crossover, mm -hmm. um, as we see the failures in, in Barack Obama, are really important. So as a, a young Barack Obama voter yourself, what is it about him that, that had brought you in uh, to, to begin with? Oh, you know, it's embarrassing. It was his rhetoric. It was the whole story and theatrics of his uh, candidacy and how he made speeches that made him sound like he was Abraham Lincoln or JFK, who at the time I very much revered because I was a product of public school and I, was, I studied history. And what I thought was, wow, this guy gives speeches like a good president. He's probably going to be a good president. And I just didn't bother to fact check anything. And like a lot of people, once he got elected, I just left it to him and I didn't do anything and I became apathetic and that was the big contrast with Ron Paul because even though Ron Paul didn't win, I mean I was involved in the 2012 campaign, even though he didn't win, so many young people still stayed involved in politics even without him in office. So I think that contrast is really important to notice because most Obama supporters have no clue about anything he's done while in office. Maybe they know about Obamacare, you know, and maybe they've heard of drones and the NSA, but they make excuses where people who supported Ron Paul, and this is people of all ages, not just young people, they're also very engaged, active, even though they didn't even get the guy in office, so... Yeah, and, and of course, you know, the gone. Democrats are supposed to be the uh, the anti-war people, and, and, you know, they got out in, in droves to uh, to protest Bush and, and those invasions, but, uh, you know, the surge and the uh, the drone strikes, and, and now even, uh, you know, provoking Russia, uh, nothing, absolutely nothing. So, but mm -hmm. my, my, I guess my next question would be, was it, was it more the failures of Obama or, or the relevance of the libertarian message that, that did your switch? Like how did that evolution happen? Because I think it's really telling for the youth block that did vote for Obama to kind of figure this one out, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess it's both. Well, what happened for me is I stopped paying attention to the news. And then when the Egyptian revolution broke out in 2011, I just felt extremely ignorant and uninformed. And I felt that it was my responsibility to start paying attention to what was going on in the world. And one news article about Barack Obama adding someone from Goldman Sachs to his cabinet just sort of 
I never looked back. And I had never really even been engaged in what Obama did once he won. Like, I just shut off and went back to my life, like most people do. And right at the time that I was starting to look at what was going on in the world, a friend introduced me to Ron Paul. And I started hearing all of these things that I had felt and thought in the time that I had started to, I guess, distance myself from Obama. And it just went from there, and I went down the rabbit hole pretty deep. <laughs> so so what's next? I mean, obviously, this is a, a huge, huge video. Is there going to be, like, a follow-up? Like, what, what else do you have in store? What is, what is In Rogue about? Oh, I have sense. Well, In Rogue is actually, when I became politically active, I also started writing a book about an unrelated topic. Um, they, they sort of coincided, but I came out of the Hollywood film industry. That's what I thought I wanted to do before I became an activist. And I had spent, I'm born and raised in L.A. I'm a Valley girl. That's what my dumb little voice is that I do in videos that some people don't get. Um, <laughs> that's me making fun of my former self. But I was very much invested in everything the corporate media told me, um, whether it was Barack Obama or Britney Spears. And at the same time that I was becoming politically aware, I really started to take a look at the culture around me and how that had influenced my ignorance and contributed to ultimately what was my fault, but was a lack of self-empowerment. And so I've written a book about the influence of corporate media and celebrity culture on girls and women in the hopes of sort of helping a lot of girls that are tied into that kind of culture break out of how constricting it can be and how much it tends to diminish self-empowerment and, you know, real self-esteem. Um, and it's not it's not political. It's not towards the end because I'll be, I, I can't not be political. Um, but in Rogue, it's just mean, it means to break out from what the matrix, the system that you're a part of, whether it's this corporate media or it's the state, because ultimately they're both very distracting and one feeds the other in my opinion. So I do have a book coming out. It'll be out this summer, I believe. And uh, I have plenty of new videos coming. I have a couple I'm really excited for that I'm going to be releasing, at least one next week. Um, so I, I look forward to that. And I have a blog, too, because I am a writer before I'm a, a YouTube video maker. But I do really love YouTube. I'm really getting into video editing. <laughs> It's definitely good to cover all bases and get as much media out there as possible. That's, I mean, that's what we need to do is 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 flood mm -hmm. with as much diversity as possible. And and I think that's one of the things that um mm -hmm. you, you know we were talking about this earlier in the first segment in the show is is ways to diversify the movement and diversify people behind the message that we know uh, is so powerful. And and I think work like yours mm -hmm. and, and and Josie Wales and and people like that is a is a really mm -hmm. really good sign in that diversity because we're so used to you know ever since you know i i gauge it by 2008 I'm, i i know it existed before that but uh the 2007 2008 ron paul campaigns going all the way up to now uh to me it was mostly white males and and i and i think that that mm -hmm. is true and to see uh women such as yourself and josie and others uh coming to the forefront and and putting a lot of good work out is very hopeful do you how do you, th how, what do you think is, is behind that? How do you think are some ways that we could, uh, like, diversify this message? That's a great question. Um, I think we just need to make it clear that liberty is for everyone. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is in a documentary I watched called Century of the Self. And it's about marketing the history of persuasion and manipulation, um, in the 20th century, and one of the things that really struck out to me was a study that was done in the 80s when Ronald Reagan was running for president, and never mind what Reagan did when he was in office, we're just talking about his rhetoric, and what they found was that people of all walks of life responded to that message of liberty. It wasn't any class, it wasn't any race, it was, they couldn't even tell, they couldn't predict what kind of people would respond, because it was everyone. And so I think what needs to be done is to just demonstrate that this idea is universal and it's not for a certain class of people. It's just for people who want to be free. And I think that the more different kinds of people we have spreading that, the better. And, you know, there's me, there's Josie, there's um, Derek Jay. He's a totally different kind of message. And it's so cool that there are so many different people being drawn in now. Um, but as far as moving forward, that's ultimately what I want to do with my book. That's why I wrote a book uh, specifically geared towards girls and women, and I am not a traditional feminist by any means. I think that feminism is a detriment to society, but... So I no, so no free bleeding for Carrie Redler? Can we just please get that on the record? 
No, 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 no. Yeah, that is on the record permanently, never. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I think, because what I'm doing, I've actually, it's been really exciting because I've gotten a lot of outreach from girls who, you know, I, I, I message them back because I really like hearing from girls and I'll check out their profile. And there are girls that are into this celebrity culture and that have been uninformed for a while. And they've told me that watching my video made them really want to be aware of what's going on in the world. And that's the best feeling I could get because I used to be that girl. You know, I used to be the girl that didn't care whatsoever and just had like a small political opinion that I thought was completely informed and correct and wasn't. And, and you know, spent the rest of my time worrying about Hollywood. And so I really love hearing from girls that are ready to start paying attention to other things. Absolutely. And, and I, you know, you, you brought up something that I think is, is really, really powerful in that you, you've gotten a reaction as a woman doing this from more women who might not otherwise have engaged in this message or someone carrying the Mm -hmm. message. I mean, you, I mean, I, I have no idea, but it could be just because, you know, you were a woman that they did that. That's what they were looking for motivation. And, and I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Adam Kokesh and how he resonates with, with, uh, veterans. I know I, in my work, uh, frankly, Mm -hmm. I've been broke ever since I've gotten into this movement and I've attracted a lot of broke people who feel alone or powerless. And I'm like, look, dude, just with some grit Mm -hmm. and determination and, and good friends, I, I have done a lot and so can you. And I, and I think that message of, or that idea of what you put out, you're going to attract and then hopefully turn into, uh, Mm -hmm. actors then is, is very, very powerful. Absolutely. And and another thing that you you touched on that I think is very good is is because our message has something to uh, for everybody is it's very very consistent. You know, we we oppose Reagan uh-huh. just as much as we oppose uh, you know Bush or Obama or anybody. And I think that speaks a lot to people from mm-hmm. different uh, demographics because uh, typically or you know. Republicans or people on the right are supposed to love Reagan, you know what I mean? Like, and that's that's just not the uh, mm-hmm. the case. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, I'm sorry, I totally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but I I knew what I was going to say. Um, that's the beauty of live radio. Your, your question. <laughs> <laughs> what? I said that's the beauty of live radio. It happens to all of us. Okay, good. Good to know. I'm I'm sort of new to doing interviews, but it is really fun. Um, yeah, I would totally agree. And I think oh, what I was going to say is that when I explain the non-aggression principle to people, it's something that everyone understands. No one goes, no, that's wrong. So, and everyone understands then the next step, which is that government is a violation of that. And they sort of nod their heads and they think about it and they understand. And I think it's because we've all been taught, whether through public institutions or from our families or from society, that to initiate force against others is wrong. And so on one hand, it's maddening that the government is there in public schools teaching, you know, because they always tell people, be nice to others, you know, share and this whole communal idea, um, which you don't need the government to enforce. It's just human nature, in my view, to be generous and to be kind to others. And so it's something that people do recognize. And then when you make that leap for them to explaining how government operates in violation of that, it's something clicks for them. And even if they're not ready to fully switch to our view, it's it's something that stays with them. And then I think when they see news stories and they hear about things that are going on in the world, they remember that. And that helps them in their progression. Absolutely. So would you describe yourself as the the A word? Are 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 you an anarchist? I don't know. I mean, in theory, I guess so, because what happened for me is I was a history major. And like I said, that's why I was so into Barack Obama, uh, because I fell for the narrative of American history. And once I snapped out of that, everything that I had learned in school sort of realigned and helped me refocus my perspective of government. And it all just seemed to make sense. And I realized all of this oppression and all of this death and all of this corruption can always be rooted back to government, and it's not government as central authority. So before government, there was the church, and it acted as a government. And so this use of force is just so consistently bad that it, it's hard to not, it's hard to be a minarchist for me, you know? It's, it's hard to endorse some force and for a certain amount of time and not others. So I guess you could call me that A-word. <laughs> so... 
obviously that's in in that community that's been the big debate and statist is is almost like uh, is a huge like slur it's like the worst thing you call somebody anymore it's kind of silly in my opinion yeah. <laughs> but how do you feel i mean given yeah. the you know pragmatically as of right now and in the foreseeable future we have a government we have that structure how do you feel about mm-hmm. that because my personal opinion is that we advocate social change, and that's the best that we could do. If some people take that social change and mm-hmm. that affects their voting patterns, um, you know, what are we going to do? You know, that's that's. But is is mm-hmm. uh, to me, it's the same thing because, uh, in a sense, because in theory, even if you're a minarchist, uh, it's an informed citizenry that is going to hold the government in check, mm-hmm. and that's basically what we're all about: uh-huh. is an informed citizenry, whether it's about the nature of government, your own rights. Whatever. How do how do you feel? Like, do we engage with the political system? What do you, what do you think? Um, you know, I have friends that work within the political system, and it's personally not something that I would do. But they have been working on NSA legislation um, out in California. Here, they nullified the NDAA, so that's pretty cool. Because even though I don't believe in the theory of government, their policy still affects me. And even though I don't want to be the one in politics working on that, there are people who are still doing good work, and there are people who are trying to shut down the electricity for the NSA so that they can't operate. So this is tangible progress, although I do think that what's more important is to change the perspective. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight either. I mean, not everyone's going to wake up tomorrow morning and be an anarchist. But if we can help them in their evolution, I think that ultimately that's going to make the biggest difference because, I mean, everyone's running for president in 2020 on the platform of dissolving the federal government. And I don't know if he'll win, but I do think that by 2020, there are going to be a lot more people who are in favor of that than there are today. So let me let me kick an idea off I mean, to you, because if, if you have the ability to get to more of a, of a different demographic than I can, then I, I feel obligated mm-hmm. to, to throw this out there. My thesis is that... Um, there, there really is no such thing as anarchists right now because I, I believe that to be a governed anarchist uh, is an oxymoron. I mean, we, we, we have that thing in place, and just saying we know it's crap and we don't like it I don't think makes us mm-hmm. anarchists. So I think something uh, – the word that I would use that describes us, whether you are a, quote, left or right anarchist or whatever, um, I think that something that unites all of us is that we are abolitionists. Um, and even even minarchists, okay. they they and and others, you know, uh, constitutionalists, whatever, they want to abolish very 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 large sections of the uh, the government. So I, I feel that if we stop carrying this left right paradigm into our anarchistic philosophy, which is supposed to be based on no rulers anyway, um, that that would go mm-hmm. a lot farther when when we umbrella it under a more pragmatic approach of we're all abolitionists. I can agree with that. And I mean, honestly, I'm not one for labeling myself. Like, I don't go around calling myself an anarchist. Um, I just use the term libertarian. But um, I think you're right. I think that it, there's just so much division in, I mean, in every movement. It's not just the liberty movement, but th- there's just so much infighting and so much hatred and aggression towards each other. That, I mean, people, we can't even communicate peacefully. So how do we expect to live peacefully with others if we're promoting so much division and condescension among people. Um, not that I agree with leftist anarchists, but I do think that the longer people stay divided, the longer it's going to take to achieve a free and peaceful society. And this is just a parallel to what he mentioned, the left-right paradigm. So how are we better than them if we're just going back and forth and fighting with each other and not finding any common ground? Because we can't do it alone. Like we need, to, although the evolution may and hopefully will become one of libertarianism and true freedom, we're not going to do it alone because we need to work with others because there are a lot of different kinds of people that are very disgruntled with the government now. So it's, do you f- it's not even just between anarchists. It's in all sections. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. And that's, and that's like one of their biggest... Uh weapons is to divide us you know i mean we in leaked documents we see that Mm -hmm. that is what they what they try to do you know there was recently a leaked document from snowden on on um having trolls out there to to incite division in in people by uh subverting their psychology whether it's you know find out the characters Mm -hmm. who are susceptible to egotism and feed that so that they become you know Mm -hmm. ineffective and things like that um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's mm-hmm. definitely on my mind constantly is, is unifying, uh, even if we don't agree on everything. Um, we got four minutes left. I, so 
what, in that in that vein of, of unity and bringing in diversity and all of these kind of things, are there any particular issues that you feel um, this message carries through that resonate more with women than with men, or like if like is there a certain thing that you would lead off with to a woman more a woman more than a man to try and wake them up? Um, that's a good question. Um, my approach has been and tends to work when I talk to girls. Because I live in L.A., so there's a lot of there are a lot of girls out here that aren't informed whatsoever. Um, and I was just talking to a couple of girls yesterday, and they were saying, well, I just don't feel that I can do anything, and it's I'd rather just live my life. And, you know, these are girls who just spend all of their money on designer clothes and aren't interested in anything that's going on in the world. And so when I talk to girls like that, I first like to start by explaining – well, I don't want to sound condescending, not explaining, but by – um, questioning them about the things that they are interested in, in and the things that they do care about because that tends to be their magazines and their reality TV. And when we discuss that and we talk about how limiting those things can be, I can then carry the conversation over into other things that matter. And it's not, I mean, I'm not going to tell every woman that she needs to be a political activist because that's unrealistic. And I wouldn't tell every man he needs to be a political activist. But what I would urge both sexes to do, and I don't think there's any difference here, is to acknowledge, one, that by not caring and by not being informed, you're endorsing that system and you're allowing it to become more corrupt. And then also just to acknowledge that if you were to just stand up once, if you were to come out to a march, like we're doing a March for Peace rally on July 4th this year in D.C., if you showed up for that and let the government know that you're dissatisfied with their policy, they will listen and they'll be terrified. They're already terrified and most of the population isn't paying attention. And so if we could get... 5% 5% more people out in the street every once in a while or online, let the NSA monitor what we're saying. If we get just a few more people, not a few, you know, like just relatively a few, but if we get more people involved, then, I mean, there's no challenge. And that's what's so frustrating is that it's re- it's not that hard happening in every other country. So it, it should happen here. Although I do think that a lot of the revolutions in other countries are misguided because they're seeking more government. So it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, indeed. And a lot of times it looks like they are manufactured by, of course, American government interests. Um, that seems to be mm-hmm. the case with, with most of them. But you mentioned a, a March for Peace. Um, what, I actually have not heard about this event. Um, what's, what's up with that? Yeah, we actually haven't even begun promoting it much yet. But uh, do you know Jeffrey Phillips? Absolutely. He's Adam's manager. Um, or was, yeah, um, I'm working on that with Jeffrey Phillips and Sierra Adamson and um, Jeff's Beyonce, actually. She's also a great political activist. Her name's Kayla, Kayla Tang. And so we are working on a march in D.C. It's not anti-anything because we really want to spread a message of positivity and being for things. So what we want to do is rally in Washington and let the world know that what our government does is not one and that we are sorry that America has been bombing people and killing them for years, and also to let the government know that we're dissatisfied with this policy and just make a statement because there hasn't been, I mean, it's always anti-something rallies. In the last anti-war rally that was really big was during the Bush years. So we want to start something that's more proactive and more for something and really trying to cultivate enthusiasm for that as opposed to being angry or resentful and working against things because working against things clearly hasn't worked too well because we're here (laughs) and people have been fighting against the system for a long time. So we want to create a new system for lack of a better word that is founded on love and peace and prosperity as opposed to fighting against the state or products of the state. Absolutely. All right. Well, Carrie, thanks a lot for joining us. You know, I, I met you about a year ago when I was at Adams. You were very bubbly. You got a, a good energy mm-hmm. about you. So I'm glad to have <laughs> you on our team and uh, great work with the video. And we hope to see more. Thank you. Yeah. And look out for more information on the March. We'll be releasing more info soon. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we will be right back to talk about more news straight from Facebook.com slash The Big Plantation. We'll be right back. One young man crossed over the Iraq.